Hello and welcome to the Guitar Hang Podcast. I'm your host, John Stancor. Today we've got a real treat for you as we delve into the world of that pedal show. I'm hanging today with the incredible Mick Taylor and the ingenious Dan Steinhardt. Their YouTube show has garnered a dedicated following, serving as a treasure trove of pedal knowledge and sonic exploration. In this exclusive conversation, we'll take a deep dive into Mick and Dan's profound passion for pedals, problem solving through technology, and a never-ending quest for tone. They've enjoyed a remarkable journey building that pedal show and the enchanting sonic landscapes they've uncovered for fellow gearheads and music lovers alike. Please make sure you hit the subscribe button below and ring the bell for notifications. And now, let's hang with Mick and Dan. 6 a.m. 6 class yeah and uh it's just been fabulous really loving it that's wonderful do you train yourself i started when i was hi mick hey how are you good thank you john how are you i'm wonderful we're just talking about martial arts ah i started it when i was a uh sophomore in high school right in the korean martial arts taekwondo Okay. And I got my uh, first degree when I was uh, just right out of high school. Wow. But we were doing a lot of um, breaking techniques with okay. and hands, and it was not a great idea to try to pursue, yes, of course. <laughs> you know, beating bricks into oblivion with your, with your knuckles and that sort of thing. So I, while it was a great, um, it was a great springboard for discipline. <laughs> For music, it was not something that was sustainable. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But with uh, with what what you're enrolled in, I think that would be something that you could do well into your advancing age. Yeah, that's the plan. Getting that's that. the plan. Yeah. Get, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's uh, that's you. You pick wisely. I the the Korean martial arts was um. Uh, probably about 80% foot, foot technique and 20% hands. So. Right. I was just saying that any any show that is attempting to do what, what I'm doing would uh, count it as a high honor and you would expect to have been around for a long time to have you guys on a, a program like this because I think we collectively, I'll speak for all of us in the guitar community, think you guys are the ambassadors of goodwill when it comes to the guitar playing at large. Uh, it's very kind. Thank you, man. Thank That's you. kind of you to say. Well, likewise, it's an honor to be asked on. You know, I, I read the blurb and it's like some of your previous guests. So, you know, proper guitar players. So to include Dan and I in that is, uh, <laughs> is, uh, is, a tri is a trip. So thank you for having us. The one through line is all of those folks are huge fans of yours. Yeah. It's, uh, it, um, it, it, we hear these things from time to time and we meet people and they tell us that and it it, it never gets any less uh i don't want to say weird but it never it's kind of overwhelming to hear that surreal yeah because obviously we're 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 fans of of all our favorite bands and all our favorite players and and the artists who who have enabled us to do what we do so it's great it's great that there's this um you know we've become aware of this community that exists not around us, but around this thing that we all love together. And uh, that is just a trip. Yeah, it's wonderful to be a so, part of it. I suspect that if you guys were uh, decided to do a 180 and pivot and do something about uh, Victorian furniture reupholstery, that people would still <laughs> follow your program yeah. because they love you, the two of you. Yeah, 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 they yeah, love yeah. the interaction because that's at its core. They always say that you'll have the most success if you're just uniquely yourself. Yeah. Well, we're just as likely yeah, yeah. to feature uh, Victorian <laughs> reupholstering as we are to feature a two screamer. So, you know. Well, right. it's, fun it's funny you should mention that. So Joey Landreth has just been through. Um, yes, he has. And he was yes, he has. traveling with his tour manager, Sean. And uh, we're sat there having dinner and Sean gets these pictures out of this furniture that he <laughs> that he restores, you know, and that's his passion. It's the yeah. same. It's the same mechanism, isn't it? It's the same mechanism. Yeah, because, you know, in the, again, the through line is we all just want to find connection. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. If somebody that follows your channel has never met you, they feel like that the, they have, they, they're getting to know you because yeah. 
it's a very human program. I mean, there, you know, it's there's a lot of laughter. sometimes very human, right? <laughs> and uh, one of my more favorite interviews was uh, with a, a guy that I met a couple times because we were both Dallas natives, or not? I'm not a native of Dallas, and neither is Andy Timmons. But we had an interview uh, a couple weeks ago, and I said the most amazing thing that I had ever seen, um, as far as youtube clip was uh his performance on your show yeah that was that to this day that's i i, I watch it i i i was doing the thing yeah. that, that was incredible yeah yeah and the beautiful thing was that he just started playing it we just felt in the moment that this thing that he'd been working on he just felt to play it and it was you know it was just it was magical. See, we'd been playing with Andy that week and lots of late nights and lots of miles and and so we're all feeling a bit tired and we thought, no, we've got to, we, you know, we have to film a show with Andy because he's catching the, the uh, flight later yeah. that day. Let's just, you know, let's just get some tones up and, and so we, we plugged him in and we got this sound and uh, found a couple of EV, EV speakers in this old uh, Mesa Boogie cabinet that Mix got and we and he he really loved it. And he just connected with them, and then, and it just all sort of happens. Really, really magical. Really magical. And and you know he is, he is such a beautiful human. Uh, yeah. he, he's, and because of his facility, he can play his emotions and his personality. And that is Andy. He's so such a beautiful guy. But when he plays, you that's you're experiencing him and it's like man it's it's a real honor and you know being in the room with him while he does that stuff and being able to share a stage with him for a week was just something we'll never forget yeah well we saw a sound guy come up to andy in tears and hugging him <laughs> saying man that was you know uh, that wasn't guitar sound that was guitar emotion you know this uh sound guy that had been sort of beaten around from you know uh years and years on the road and he just and he just sort of broke through it was really yeah yeah can't say enough wonderful things about him we were talking at, about a quote that george harrison made about ravi shankar that, that he said that when he walked into the room he himself was music yeah. okay interesting that he embodied that sure. was music and and the instrument was just a, the the you know the, the vehicle the vehicle yeah express yeah. that that's and the com sorry oh that's all that's all i am oh i was gonna say that's the common thread you know we were talking about common threads earlier and that's the common thread that runs through i guess the community that we were talking about but also every guest we have on i just processed some audio this morning we had jocelyn gould on who's a canadian jazz guitar player and she was talking about exactly that. She mm. was she was requoting uh, a Coltrane quote, I think, who said, you know, and and I can't count the number of musos that have said this to me. The one I remember most vividly is Robin Ford, and it's practice, 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 and then in the second you get on stage, forget, don't think, because thought is uh, there, again. There's many famous quotes on this, but thought is is genuinely the enemy of creativity. Mm, right. And once you connect in that way, and it's this, and to, to bring it back to your martial arts conversation before, it's exactly the same. The minute you're consciously thinking about anything, creativity completely dies. Mm. And it's getting into that mode that I think is where all art lies. And I think we could include martial arts with, with any kind of art that we would think of, yeah, paint, yeah. painting, music, and all that. And it is, the more you see it, the older you get, and the more you realize just how true it is, the greater the paradox then becomes with trying to get there because yeah, <laughs> you have right. to put all this work in <laughs> and it is just, it's endless work, isn't it? And, and that's what Jocelyn was talking about. She was saying, you know, yeah, it's work and there's no way around it. Mm -hmm. You can't fake it. There's no faking it till you make it. If yeah. you want to achieve that plane. Yeah. And it's, it's very inspiring and pretty scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I read an interview with uh, somebody that, attended a uh, Jim Hall clinic. Oh, wow. Jazz guitar player. And, and they, 
and the students there were asking him about playing over two five one changes and how to know how to navigate this that and the other thing and he said you know i could tell you all those things that i know but it my best advice to you would be to listen to the music but even more than that go to go to an art museum go take a walk there's music and beauty and everything are all tied together you just mm-hmm. have to go out and experience things and when you come back and you've, you have to practice and study but it will inform your playing in a way that you could never get to just by studying yeah. my licks yeah absolutely so you kind of have to live life and be a human being and take in all all the good and the bad and yeah. let that filter through your your music yeah. thing and 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 everything you know we we often use the term my life it's it's not your life it's life and it's right. it's intertwined with every other thing that enjoys life it's one thing it's not your unique experience it's i'm at risk of sounding like a hippie but it's how i live <laughs> and it, it, and it's made a fundamental change to how one thinks about things including music because we we sit there and we try and compartmentalize our lives into these different things we do it's all the same thing you just need to find the dots connect the dots yeah which is exactly what you're saying john meanwhile let's talk about the hot cake <laughs> <laughs> right actually i was just uh lusting after some of the new thorpey puddles that uh, have been released. oh yeah so oh, he makes a good pedal that man yes we've got the new we've got the two special editions here actually. oh great but uh yeah, no, we're big fans of adrian's the uh the one thing that i think would be fascinating because I don't know that anybody's asked is just had what was your entry point to music were you were you all did you guys start playing at a time when it was just LPs pre MTV pre internet I mean all that kind of stuff I'm 58 I suppose you guys are close to my age yeah uh, I'll, next, I'll, next, I'll be 50 in March Dan is, yeah so we're not far away yeah uh yeah, my entry into music was a was a bit weird. I didn't. I grew up in a very religious family. We didn't have rock music or anything in the house. And but my brother got a guitar for Christmas. And the story goes, when my mum was pregnant with me, she was learning to play guitar, and she only stopped when she couldn't reach the guitar. And I was three. And my brother was seven, and he got you know one of those cheap guitars and that triangle cardboard box. And he pulled it out. <laughs> he strummed the strings. And I had a meltdown. As soon as I heard it, there was something about the sound that I just like freaked me out. And then so mum went and got me a little classical guitar. And I think I've played guitar most days since. Um, for me, it was definitely the sound of the instrument as opposed to being, you know, something about the the music or the culture or the, you know, thing. It was just like, I was just so drawn to the sound of the instrument. Um, I think yours was, definitely from a your dad had lots of the yeah same thing so i think the sound was is certainly number one and number two is iconography i think mm. the way the way it looks visually uh and and what it represented which i think you could get deeply psychological about but funnily enough as as way of a complete round story yesterday was my dad's 80th birthday oh wow and uh my dad lives in in um, a little town near Oxford, and my, to this day, my dad still gets up and sings, and he runs this little open mic karaoke type night. And uh, we did a pretty much an all day yesterday, so I turn up there with a little PA, and he's got his little PA, and we set it up, and a couple bands come and play, people get up and sing, and as a complete, so as a two year old, there I am listening to Johnny Cash and Conway Twitty and. Um, he was so into country and Western music in a big way, but also a bit of Elvis, rock and roll, mm. Carl Perkins, that kind of thing. So uh, for those who don't want to do the maths, uh, it would have been 1976 that I was two years old. Uh, and then right from the get-go, there were there were guitars around the house. I mean, he wasn't a serious player, but he did go out and sing and strum. Right. And then uh, it was kind of, it almost felt inevitable, but he never pushed me they never ever pushed me to play music because my mum wasn't into it at all 
And then by the time I was eight or nine, I was really seriously into it. And then by the time I was 13 or 14, he was driving me around to gigs and uh, and enabled rather than pushed, kind of enabled. Uh, and then there we were yesterday. And then for the last song on my set, I got him up and we did Folsom Prison Blues. Oh, man, his that's favorite, awesome. It's his favourite song of all time. And it was quite the moment, you know. Oh, so yeah, I've got, a, I have to, I have to credit my dad with, um, a being passionate about it, but B having the tools around and music always playing, you know, always. That's lovely. Always playing. So yeah, and I think like Dan said, it's the sound of the thing. Yeah. Um, married with with the iconography of of what that is, you know, the hero stood there. Oh yeah. With this thing. See, I mean, it's <laughs> so powerful. Borderline Spinal Tap quote at this moment, but <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. But that, who wouldn't want that, you know? Yeah. And I think other people are equally affected by seeing drums or whatever. But, you know. I drove past Stonehenge on the way here. It was yeah. brilliant. I was, I was driving past the guy. And not like a, the only thing that kept going on in my brain is, oh, this is fantastic. So we'll, we'll follow these contours and shapes exactly when we get the real piece. <laughs> you have to be four years old and to be kept <laughs> with their Perkins guitar. Would, that's, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and and all that early country stuff, um, and then my brother, who's a little older than me, he was in bands, and then all my friends seemed to be in bands. So, again, for those people who don't want to do the maths, this would now be early '80s, so music's changing very quickly, um, and a lot of the people of my brother's generation were in that sort of, in the UK anyway, and I don't know how it is in the US, uh, the sort of punk, 1970s angry oppressed difficult economic times so they were into new wave and punk and music that really spoke of of politics and of of all of that my generation much much softer and we were just able to enjoy rock music for what it was because <laughs> you know the punk thing was sort of a reaction to the big rock thing and then the big rock thing came back so mm -hmm. as the 80s rolled around uh, we go through the new romantic thing, but then much later, in come Guns N' Roses, in come Pearl Jam, in come as the 90s come around. When I was 16 in 1990, Pearl Jam, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Alice in Chains, uh, all the bands that preceded Soundgarden and Pearl Jam, Mother Love Bone, Temple of the Dog, right. all that stuff. So it was like it was a reinvention of of Hendrix, really. Right. Throw Stevie Ray into that mix. I'm done. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All the all the bands that you named at that age, it's a very uh, that the whole Seattle thing was quite a. I I really started playing in earnest in the height of the hair metal thing. All right. It's a guy that could never grow my hair like that. <laughs> There's a band that could do scissor kicks off the drum riser or any of that kind of foolery. <laughs> I thought you know this is probably not going to be so i was really into studio guitar players i was reading oh wow okay billy dan albums and checking out who larry carlton dean parks jay graden you know that was, guys yeah mm -hmm. but um as luck would have it i got a ticket to see uh pink floyd in cleveland and drove from wow. ohio to cleveland and was about 100 yards back uh watching that and i thought i could do that <laughs> and so all these years, for the last 15 years i've been touring with the pink floyd tribute group doing you know oh, no way. it's 16 states so far and we do the big laser light show and the the whole the whole, the whole shebang uh, and i've gotten to play with scott page the saxophone player that i saw that night i would go out to la and do shows with uh, him and some other folks doing a uh, Pink Floyd show in this immersive video thing. So the Flo David Gilmore was my way of realizing yeah. it didn't have to be a guitar, an Eddie Van Halen or a George Lynch or Warren Demar yeah. Pratt. You could be just, you kind yeah. of look like what I would hope my dad would look like. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. I think there's something, having seen them live as well, I bet, because it's, the whole aesthetic, so the look, the feel, the way it hits you in the chest, it's a complete bunch of 
feelings and you can only get that from a live rock and roll show yeah, totally. i mean I, I don't want to bang on about this because dan and i are, are at risk of sounding like old people but it's the one thing i i upsets me about modern gigs they just don't hit you in the way that they used to hit you and so if you take away that element of the soup then we're in a different territory and there's nothing bad about change great let's let's evolve let's do it but it's when it's kind of put forward as being the same thing yeah it's not the same thing and it it is truly life-changing to experience that very analog experience and i don't i don't know maybe i'm just being rose tinted glasses but the way it made you feel was com was was a complete feeling yeah there was no distraction you weren't looking at your phone no you weren't trying to video it because you know i, I see people videoing stuff at shows i'm like look just watch just use your eyes <laughs> you're never going to watch that back yeah just watch it in the first just, place just be in this moment yeah. don't be in the moment of oh i hope i get this because then you miss this moment yeah and anyway i'm, I'm gonna stop but it is <laughs> so but we it's something that that we do bang on about so we had an artist on recently a gentleman called mike van Art, who is the other guitar player in, in biffy clyro and mike and simon you've got a, a new band together called empire state bastard and they and they are a sort of very loud shoegazy very heavy it's the heaviest music i've ever heard yeah it's 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 quite incredible and they were playing a festival and this, you know, you know, come along and, you know, Russian circles are playing and a bunch of other bands that I, that I really want to see. So I took my son along and the sound guy said, I, look, I know you're a fan of, of doing it old style and doing it loud. He said, I want to show you something and showed me the, the rider from all the bands to the sound guys. And each band had written, we are a loud band. Do not tell us to turn down. This is part of our sound. <laughs> And it was, it was flippin' awesome. And there was like six bands on this page that had gone to that said similar things. And what was amazing was that the sound was it wasn't about volume. It was about a shared experience. Because at that point, you were no longer actively listening. You were simply experiencing. You were simply in that moment. And what happened was you're in that moment with a thousand other people yeah. in that tent, and you're all experiencing something. And it's like, no wonder we had these massive movements around music when people could gather together and, and experience this such yeah. a powerful, life-changing thing. And it was truly, it was so wonderful. After years of um, being in a different world where, you know, doing wedding gigs and, and all this sort of stuff, which is great, it's very controlled, it's very nice. It's like, oh, yeah, I this is... Yeah. This is rock and roll. This is where the <laughs> attitude never really comes out, and yeah, it's, it's still out there. Yeah, it was a. I grew up in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, and uh, sadly, in 1979, we had the Who tragedy where the kids were killed at the concert. But it, prior to that, it was a very dangerous thing going to rock shows. Yeah, yeah right. right. Yeah, there was, uh, you know, there was two. Too many people, too few security. Uh, oh, yeah, all kinds of. So my parents were never crazy about me going to shows. My first show was uh, Ted Nugent and Blackfoot, <laughs> and then, wow. and Ted, uh, at, I think during the encore was wearing a loincloth and he swung across the stage on a rope and and then took an arrow and shot it into a you know, a flaming thing on the other side of the day. It was, it was like, holy shit. That was my first show. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't he used to have like live Buffalo on stage and stuff yeah. as well? Yeah, he had a song yeah. called Great White Buffalo. I yeah. think at that time when I saw him, it was his Intensity in 10 Cities tour. <laughs> it was like a 10 city tour and Intensity <laughs> in 10 Cities. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was a, a very dangerous thing, but the thing that was so exciting was a lot of times you didn't really, some of these artists, you didn't know uh, what they would yeah. look like. Like Pink Floyd, you wouldn't know what they look like necessarily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd see the show and, or it was pre-MTV, pre-internet, again, sounding like back in my day, you know, you know, the old yeah. guy, but it was, it was a different thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when you're all crowded together and somebody's getting sick on your shoes, <laughs> when you're 
trying to, you know, the massive, the sea of people, you know, Led Zeppelin wrote that song, <laughs> The Ocean, about the audiences, you know. Yeah, yeah. Massive amount of people sway. But it was a completely, it was almost like what I would guess going to the Roman Colosseum, you know. Yeah. So, okay. That, yeah. That, that was that kind of, you, and I guess it was depicted very well in uh, Pink Floyd, The Wall, the movie, like where they have the riot scene outside the, the Coliseum in Los Angeles and there's police there, but it was a very rock and roll was a bit dangerous back then. Yeah. 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 It's funny these days, fast forward. I go, sometimes if I go to a show, I walk in and it's all sit down. I'm like, Oh no. And then I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> nice glass of wine in a glass. Yeah. Yeah. So the, uh, the exciting thing for you guys now is that you're able to, there's a wide variety of people that you're interviewing. Some people that yeah. you've been fans of for decades, some people you're just getting turned on to. Is there anybody yeah. that's, that's still on your bucket list that you would love to have on the show? There definitely are. And it's it's interesting. Um, we've, never, we've never chased anyone for an interview. I spent years doing that on guitar magazines. And it sort of felt like this, um, for certain artists, there was a great reluctance to do press because they didn't really, they didn't enjoy it or they weren't comfortable or whatever, for whatever reason, they just didn't get, didn't love it. And those interviews were always difficult. And of course, then your skill as an interviewer, as it were, to try and break that down in whatever small time you have came to the fore we're dan and i've been so lucky that the people that come on the show want to come on the show yeah. and you know by no means is it a meeting of equals but there is at least no reluctance right. and so i think there's people we would love to have on the show but if they don't want to do it we don't want them on and that might sound really arrogant but it's a waste of everyone's time yeah like if they want to come and connect with people in a way that they are unable to do in another way or because they like me and Dan or because they like the ethos of the whole thing, then it doesn't matter if they are David Gilmore or David Smith from down the street because while David Smith from down the street might not have contributed to the pantheon of rock music, they might still have something extremely interesting and inspiring to say to people. And really that's what it's about. It's about when, when you watch the show, you come away going, wow, I want to pick up my guitar and I think I might have learned something. Mm. So, yes, there are, definitely. I mean, I had one instance recently where I was going backwards and forwards with somebody trying to sort it out. And it was quite clear that they had no idea who me and Dan were or why they were doing the show. And that's cool. Someone had said to them, oh, you should go and do... And again, I, I don't want to sound arrogant about it because for sure, you know, <laughs> that a great many famous rock guitarists have never heard of us much less care about us so it's not like i'm saying please like us i'm not saying that i'm saying everyone has a time where they go actually that would be fun mm. so that's why we don't really chase anyone and um but yes of course to get david gilmore would be completely amazing if he was ever up for it michael lando i'd really love to do he's my favorite guitar player mm. um and the favorite guitar player of a lot of my friends uh and I think top of the tree for me would be Dave Grohl. Dave Grohl, yeah. I would love to talk to Dave Grohl. But one removed from Dave Grohl. Yeah. We had Shifty on. Yeah. But it, but I, w I would just like to reiterate, I was I would be, and Dan and I are both equally happy talking to Jocelyn Gould, right? Yeah. Last Tuesday, because she's phenomenally talented she's incredibly interesting she has lots of really important and interesting things to say and she's a really decent human being so i just to reiterate the fact i'm equally happy talking to people who maybe aren't globally famous but have something valid and artistic to say and i think that's one thing tps has been able to do you know we've had quite often you get someone who might be considered quite famous and loads of the comments will say never heard of this dude or they might <laughs> they might not be famous at all. And loads of people have gone, wow, I this is great. You, I I'm discovering people that I've never heard of before. So in a way, I'd rather do that. Mm. Yeah. And, and from the other end, I, you know, I'd love to um, interview uh, Pete Cornish. 
uh, would yeah. be a, a dream. So my mate Michael Watts has just moved yeah. in next door to him. He, his, yeah, Michael said to me, <laughs> is, oh, by the way, do you know who I'm known as? I'm like, oh. If we so, could, you know. Who else, I'm sorry, besides Pete Cornish? Yeah, no, so I mean, that would be, you know, with everyone that, that Nick has mentioned, but, you know, Pete, Pete Cornish for me would be, uh, I have so many questions for him. And I just think it would be a, a fascinating conversation. It just to shake his hand yeah. would be amazing. But you could basically, you could list them all. You could list them all like Dan Huff, oh, Brent Mason. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. You know, just, just, just keep listing them. And the, all those people that have that incredible body of work yeah. would be fascinating to, to get into that. And they, and they are endless, so I don't want to not mention somebody who we right, would right. clearly love to have on the show because it's pretty much anybody and everybody who's passionate about it. The uh, to take a little bit of a, a gear detour, maybe you can help me understand a little bit about the Pete Cornish. Thing. I've been aware of Pete Cornish and his individual pedals, but the pedal boards that he would make for David Gilmore or for Brian May or even uh, Gary Kemp uses one. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Nick Mason project. They're not, correct me if I'm wrong, they're not MIDI switching. What they are is it's a pedal board that it has essentially individual pedals housed in the unit. And yeah, it all depends on the rig. So they're built custom for each artist and he just creates a system with everything that the artist needs that whether it's just turning on one thing at a time or hitting a button and controlling a bunch of things, he'll just create a system that's exactly what the artist needs for a specific project or, um, you know, and they're, and they're, they're quite extraordinary. Uh, he, again, there's a, a few um, amazing engineers that are sort of military trained, uh, Pete being a wonderful example, yeah. as well as Roger Mayer, Thorpey, um you know but i think what what pete did for the you know, touring artists of the of the the day you know brian may and all the all the guys that you mentioned is really gave them the facility to to have this live production tool to take these sounds that they created in the studio and that was so important to the uh, the atmosphere of the album and what was, you know, what, what they were projecting at the time and, and gave them the facility to bring that live. Right. And, you know, he was, he was a real pioneer in the ability to do that and did it in such a way that was, you know, absolutely rugged and reliable. And, you know, to do that with seventies technology was, that's was no thing. mean feat. That's the thing, isn't it? It might be hard for people uh, these days used to modern tech to kind of understand the rigors of a proper rock and roll tour. So features and benefits, you know, oh, doesn't have 128 MIDI presets or um, it couldn't do this or it was too expensive to fly. Any of that, those sort of modern uh, considerations are out the window in the 70s and 80s. It's just all about how do we make this thing work every night and yep. not break? Yep and sound fantastic. And the difference between, I see this in video and audio gear, you know, the difference between consumer video and audio gear and professional audio gear is like, yeah. it's vast, it's vast. In the way that it's made, the uh, ruggedness and roadworthiness and all that. So I think half of what, Dan just said it, but half of what Pete was about was getting the sound, the other half was making it actually work. Yeah. In, in that environment getting thrown on trucks and you know hammered around the world yeah. so i remember i was uh I remember talking to chris squire years ago and he had a pete cornish rig and you know it was from the 70s in in the you know golden era of yes and they were doing something uh, he was in a band called sin and they were doing something and he pulled out his old pete cornish rig hadn't seen the light of day for 20 years he turns it on perfect not like perfect. Imagine Puts it on stage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Update needed. <laughs> but yeah. turns it on, puts it on stage, you know. So that's like for me, um, he's 
someone who really understands all the elements you know the the engineering the the sonic uh you know what actually is going to make it sound fantastic and all that stuff he was he really was a pioneer and i think it'd be a really interesting conversation to talk about some of those rigs mm. the uh the best thing that ever happened to our pink floyd group or specifically me as a uh, guitar player was meeting uh my guitar tech Dwayne adams he's a guy that was air force guy and i had been having an issue with the pedal board that i had it was so wide with all the pedals on it and trying to sing and hit all my cues and tap dance on the pedals it was just ridiculous so we were discussing using a gig rig or we ended up using a, an rjm mastermind because our computer that sends the midi information that controls the the lights and the video also will change my patches but so we i kind of have essentially a gilmore rig where there's four amp heads in a big unit with the pedals up top which i can adjust nice <laughs> why takes three guys to move but my point is being a military guy he used all of his training and know-how the, the wiring in the back of this thing is yeah, yeah, yeah. we have put that thing through, it weighs probably 800 pounds it's ridiculous to move around and we've sure. had we've had to have forklifts lifted up onto the stage we've had to figure out how to get it into an elevator but my point is it's so damn rugged because he took yeah, time yeah. and soldered each connection and everything is exactly the right line. something i could never ever do yeah. but going back to that the appreciation for guys like adrian and roger mayer and Pete Cornish, there's something to be said for that training and how it applies to. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I've seen yeah. some of some of your the work that you've done. I, I would have thought that you had the same background. I've never the inside of uh, Dave Kilminster's rig or Stephen Wilson's rig. It's like that's it's just a work of art. Oh, bless you. Thank Dave, you. I mean, that's just that's just being really enthusiastic and wanting to, you know, I'm a fan of these guys primarily, and I, I don't, you know, imagine David playing the solo for the wall, <laughs> David Kilminster, and it getting up there and not working. Right, you know, like that's not, you know, I'm going to make sure that's not going to happen. Um, so, you know, I want these guys to um, be very happy, and and so. Again, it's just it comes down to attention to detail and like I'm really messy in every other area of my life, <laughs> but I can put together a pedal board, you know, as Mick will testify to. Um, yeah, but it is it is from guys like that and seeing uh, these master rig builders and what are they paying attention to? What's the what you know, what are the big what are the big most important things? And yeah. Yeah, if you were out getting talk, coffee and it was just Mick and I talking, I would, I would, not to embarrass you, but I would say I think the gig rig is probably the most important development in the last fifteen or twenty years in terms of every player, from a pub player to a high school dance player, all the way up to a Dave Kilminster, now has the ability to take their favorite pedals and have yeah. one thing and the switch. I can't think of anything and correct me, Mick, if there's something else, but is there something bigger than this as far as something that brings the whole world together of of pedals and signal processing? Is it, it, I think if you, my, my end? Yeah, I, I would agree with you. I think if you're in the digital world, there's a lot of people that might say things like Helix and Axe FX and all that do all of that. I think what Dan has, a, and we'll talk about him while he's in the room, he has a, a unique marketing problem which is, we, we joke about this on experience days, you know, G3, whatever it costs, $1,200, $1,500, and it doesn't make a sound. <laughs> so for the for, for, for enthusiasts and, and like kind of semi-pro type players, it, it might take them a minute just to figure out what it does and, and, and why it will make their lives better. At the other end, I've been with a few fairly high-end touring artists just recently who have gone to a digital solution because it seems to make sense. And they don't seem to understand that a, that a compact G3 system will sound every bit as good as their rack. Oh, better. Or, yeah, all better, yeah. And they haven't quite 
clicked that this is possible on this small scale yet so i always joke with dan that he, he does have this unique marketing problem <laughs> people just either don't understand that it's possible or don't understand that it's possible from two directions and i was the same right so it's not until you hear what it's not doing right until you realize <laughs> what it what it's doing and I, again i'll spare his blushes any further but um yeah i w well we know just from a all the work that dan does with, with pro artists anyway he sees it day in day out but i get to see it when we come in here and we hear the guys and they bring their boards in and we build stuff up and we listen to it we wish dan and i wish we could just be in front of more people more regularly to go just listen just experience this for a second because you will be surprised every single person that walks through the door we do experience days where six people come in and uh, as part of the day we set up a couple rigs and and uh, you know play it uh, shall we say a uh, respectable volume and um to a person they all say oh wow i didn't i didn't quite realize it was that yeah because by the time you record it and stick it on YouTube and do an A-B comparison with something else, like 70% of the information is gone. Yeah. So I, I'm sorry, I'm gilding the lily a little bit here, but it's just to agree with you and 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 say that I just wish more people could hear it with their own, and I don't even want to say ears, they could experience it with their whole bodies uh, in order to understand how much better it can help you play. And that's the thing. That's the thing nobody gets. They all look at, lists of features and benefits mm. and they were like well it does this and how many midi messages and how many loops it's like no 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 don't worry about any of that how much better are you going to play when you like your sound so much you are within it and that's yes. and i'm i am now doing marketing job for dan so i'll stop <laughs> but <laughs> i think but but it's kind of you to say john and i i totally agree I think, yeah well thank you both very much i think uh, and i don't um it it's it means a lot, and I and I really appreciate it. I, I think all I really care about is that thing of being connected. And one thing that Mick and I get to do a lot is play at a reasonable volume, where the guitar is interacting with the the amp and all this sort of stuff. And as you were talking today with um Lee and Pete about it, how. Uh, Eat, uh, the, the guys at Anatons. I was filming down there this morning and um uh because we just released the G3S, which is the G3 with the little screens on it. And so we did a video with those with those guys and well, we had some really epic sounds going today. And one thing that we're saying is all these guys that um can really make the digital thing work and you know, which is awesome, but they've all grown up with uh, you know valve amps and loud valve amps and learning that dynamic and once you've got that in your hands then you can take that in a practical sense and, and make other things work but it's it's still um there's a thing about when you're when you're progressing as an artist as a, an artist as a guitar player if you're connected and when you play a note it makes you feel something and when you play it differently it it does something else with with the sound that gives you a level of dynamic and that you can really learn what that what that does your guitar playing will progress yeah and that's you know i, I guess for me i was brought up playing digital stuff you know because i thought technology was the future or, or technology is the future obviously but i i couldn't see why you wouldn't play state of the art stuff because obviously it sounded better than everything else. Otherwise, why would you make it? Right. And then I was in the studio and uh, uh, the producer says, I really want you to hear this and hands me this old electric mistress. I'm like, are you, are you high? This, <laughs> is, from the, this right. is from the 70s. I've got, look, in my rack, I've got a flanger. He right. said, no, just plug it in. And I, and I plugged it into a Lux reverb that he had cranked up in the other room. And in a few seconds, my, my life changed. I, I couldn't work out why anyone would release a bit of gear that didn't sound as good as this box yeah it still blows my mind so you know and after that i was like i just got completely um uh, into pedals and um 
There we go. Sorry, I just pressed them on Dan's screen to get something off the screen, and I thought I'd killed it. Okay. But, but that was basically the impetus behind designing the system, because up to that point, uh, you know, I was doing a lot of touring and, and loads of playing, and the stuff we were, we were playing was quite complex, and I needed the the thing with the, you know, being able to press one button and, and go to a new sound. Like, um, because the thing that I found when I went to pedals, A, the tap dancer, was just horrendous and then b when i started chaining these pedals together what came out the other end was not what went in so that was um you know looking into how do we how do we solve these problems and you know that was back in the day um that was really it might have been the early days of the internet you know it wasn't as if i could just google and and all these solutions appeared it just wasn't wasn't there and they didn't exist and yeah. the, the producer i was working with at the time you know i was lamenting this to him and he said well go make it yourself and so that's what i did i started studying electronics and then um when i moved to england with my uh, girlfriend then who's now my wife uh started talking to engineers and and uh found another engineer who who uh, found an engineer who was a guitar player and so we had this crossover language, and that's how the whole thing started. Um, but it was there was no real ambition with it. There was no, um, you know, this is a great business idea. It was like this is what I, I really need this to be able to get the most out of my pedals. Um, and yeah, and, and here we are today. Like we we released our first switcher in two thousand and four. So next year is our twenty year anniversary. Wow. Um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's been wild. But the you know, uh, the, the the most fun thing for me has been working with these amazing artists and uh, and and I say it to Mick all the time. And you know, Mick and I come from very different backgrounds musically. You know, the, so much of our lives are, are very opposite. But that shared least hemispheres, the, the completely <laughs> opposite hemispheres. Um, but that. <laughs> That shared love of of guitar and and being connected, it's a lot to have in common with someone. Yeah. And, you know, when when you meet these artists, I'm, you know, meeting um, you know, the any of the that you can mention like Graham Coxon or or Gallagher and you know, all these guys that I've, I've built rigs for, they're all the same. Yeah. They yeah. they they've connected with a. With the guitar and it's meant something to them and they've built careers off this stuff and it's like oh you're into this too and yeah. then suddenly it's like you've got things to talk about you know it's, it's pretty amazing it's that it, it, yeah i'll always be very grateful for that it's it's been a weird uh, when i started teaching in 90s in the 90s the music stores where i was teaching were way into these uh all-in-one units like yeah boss unit and then there was a Roland unit and there was a digitech unit this was this was still at least five or six years before the johnson modeler amp came out yeah okay. wow anybody anytime anybody would bring in vintage pedals most of the teachers most of the uh play kids that were coming in were looking at this stuff all like anything that is a vintage pedal that's on your back wall we would have mm. said yeah, what the hell is that yeah my only <laughs> pedals was like uh, in the back of Circus Magazine or Hit Parader. Uh, Mike Matthews would have, I think that's his name, from, from uh, Electro Harmonica. Yeah, 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 yeah. Black and white thing. And it would have all these crazy names of pedals, you know. And I was like, <laughs> I forget. I, I can't even remember all the names, but I would see these things. What the hell is that? And, I would, and then you would see one of the pedals and it was like the size of a toaster. You're like, yeah, yeah. You put your foot on that. Okay, so all that to say, I my first vintage piece of gear was uh, an Echoplex. So I got this mm -hmm. Echoplex. And I thought, man, it's kind of cool and everything. So I bought the Echoplex from for like next to nothing, and I got like a stack of these cartridges that went with it. And about a couple weeks prior to that, I was listening to this preset that was called Cliffs of Dover on some sort of. Yeah. And I was thinking, wow, finally, I can I can sound like Eric Johnson now. I've got it, this preset. I'm, I'm good to go. Yeah. So I go to see Eric Johnson in Dayton, Ohio, and I met him 
and it's so nice, such a sweet human being. And um, we got to talking and he said, yeah, I'm, I'm searching for some Echoplex tapes because I've only got one left. And he said, I can't find any. And I said, ah, I can help. So the next two days later, he was in Cincinnati and I brought some Echoplex tapes for him. I just gave them to him because I figured, what am I going to need them for? I've already got one. I didn't realize that. I, I didn't <laughs> So he gave me like a t-shirt and a sweater, but more importantly, I got to stand on stage and see sound checked. Holy oh, God. no. My life, was, I was like, I, I, oh, I completely get his pedal board. He had like, he had moved his um, tube driver, which I've got two of them now, but he, he has, he had one like turned sideways. And I said, why is it turned like that? And he goes, it just sounds better because there's less interference or whatever. But everything was like duct tape and in different angles. And it was all this George L cable stuff. Yeah. But he yeah. had two twins, I think two basket weave Marshall cabinet or, or yeah, cabinets. And then maybe, I don't know, I don't even remember what they were, but probably 50 watt Marshall heads. But and I went around front and as he was switching channels from the different amps, I could hear stuff moving around, but it, this whole sound that he created was other. Yeah, that's remarkable. <laughs> Absolutely remarkable. It, it was the, yeah, and this was at the height of Avia Musicom, you know, close to yeah. Delta was the big thing. And he was, um, it was right after the Austin city limits performance, which was his big watershed moment. But yeah, yeah. That moment I understood. <sighs> That's yeah. why those amps are so valuable. I would hear older guys say, you don't need any of that digital shit. You know, all you need is a good Princeton reverb. And I was like, yeah, right. Princeton reverb and a 55 gold top, you know, with P90. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You know, but, but uh, you don't know it. The thing is, you don't know until you know. Yeah. And equally, it, it's important to say that you might not like that either, but it, it, you have to experience it one way or the other, because if you're one of the things that's partially frustrating for or it's very frustrating sometimes for Dan and I is, you know, you'll read a comment on a video that says, you know, I've heard every demo of this going uh, and it doesn't sound anything like a 61 AC30. And it's like, well, OK, uh, or, or it sounds exactly like a 61 AC30. And I say, oh, great. Well, you know. Where did you hear the 61 AC30? Oh, I watched this demo. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> you have to experience it for yourself, which is not to say that per se it's better. It, it just that you, without that knowledge, without the experience and without knowing, then you don't know. Yeah, I've absolutely. had a recent revelation with recording gear where I kind of always knew, you know, I, I believed perhaps that, that these things would make a difference. And I sort of knew how they would make a difference, but I didn't fundamentally understand the difference they would make until I heard it. And there are no words, I don't have any words to describe it. I couldn't describe it to you. Right. All I can do is hear it and experience it and feel it. And I think it's exactly the same. Yeah, it totally is. With, with, with guitar gear, um, which is another reason to circle back, you know, why Dan and I do these experience days. I mean, all right, it's only six people at a time and we do have some ambition to make that slightly bigger, but exactly as you're experiencing pink floyd for the first time for sure we can't get everyone to see pink floyd and we can't get them to stand on stage with eric johnson but we can get them in front of some amps that they would otherwise never hear in the rest mm. of their lives and some nice guitars and some nice things and just let them experience it and go look you don't have to believe anything anymore you can literally just know now you can know for yourself very good and uh yeah we we remain committed to that yeah endeavor and i think and the reason that it's important to us is this has made a, a material difference in our lives like anyone who has any endeavor that they are passionate about and committed to it's you know it it does add a, a, a important factor in what makes life worth living and certainly for me like growing up in australia you know i wasn't sporty i didn't uh you know the, the one thing that i could do was was play guitar and you know i met my wife at a gig i met all, all my best friends are from music are playing in bands um and some of the best experiences i've ever had have been with being on stage with mates you know like yeah. to some of the tps band gigs like 
Mick and I on stage with um, Joey Landreth, one of the first ones that we did. I'll never forget that. No, no, no. That, just, that and Andy Timmons are the, Andy other, Timmons. the best gigs I've ever done. Uh, ever, just, ever, ever. It's just extraordinary moments. And it's like, um, and so this stuff is really important to us. And we know the value. We recognize the value of getting this stuff right. Mm. Um, because these experiences in the opportunity to play on stage with friends that they don't come along every day. So we want to help people make those moments count. Yeah. Yeah. It's the human interaction. And at the end of the day, yeah. the shared experiences that we have, and I'm sure playing on stage with Joey and Andy was amazing because you're all mates and it's, you all want to hear each other play well and you make each yeah. other play well because you love each other and you yeah. love yeah. pottery. And it's just the, the shared communal thing. It's as we get yeah. older, I think we're more in tune with that. I think you would think that you would be a little bit more jaded, a little bit more wanting to, but I think the, the guys that I'm running into and interviewing and talking to want more connection because it feels like we're living in a world where due to these yeah. things, yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. It's a little harder to do that. So something like mm -hmm. this or the TPS uh, jams or whatever is it's, it's a, an amazing thing to, to have. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So, and I have to congratulate you on the, the Johnny Marr thing that as much as I love Andy's, the Johnny Marr one was just, he was everything that I would hope he would be. I mean, I've seen many interviews with him, but he is the epitome of cool. He, <laughs> oh, man, he's so cool. I, you know, as much as they call Brian May the governor, I think they should call Johnny the because he's, <laughs> he is, God, what a guy. Well, we, we have to thank Noel Gallagher for that because Dan had fostered a relationship with Noel and that ended up in a show. And I think it was Noel saying to Johnny, you've got to do this or it, you should do this. It would be great. And Johnny kind of uh, graciously uh, accepted or relented. I don't know which, which it would yeah, be. It was... and we, we had the same experience, you know, just he, we get there and his, his wife uh, and Angie, who was his childhood sweetheart. And we just read the book at uh, oh. uh, the, uh, and so, and, yeah. and walking in and meeting Angie, like both of us, like, oh my God, it's really you. But she was there and she'd made lunch for us all. Yeah. Oh. And Johnny made us extremely welcome. And there was no kind of, well, hurry up, guys, we need to be out here by two o'clock. As the sort of session, as it was originally planned, came to, was coming to an end, Johnny's like, so what have you brought in the pedal board then? Let's have a listen to that. And, and another two hours unfolds. And he, he just couldn't have been more generous, yeah. you know, with his time. And he just seems to be in a place that's, um, is he's he's at peace with himself as an mm -hmm. artist and as a human i think and it just it, it then just flows and it makes it really easy for dan and i you know between the oh my god moments to actually have a conversation that's worth something to us and also to anyone who watches so thank you john we appreciate you saying and that for yeah. moments i was watching and i thought man dan and nick are loving this as much as we all are <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they yeah. were. They yeah. were. and i you know I, I i would be the first to say that in Certainly in my younger days, you know, that music was not my cup of tea at all. And yet you get a bit older and then you start to understand. You're like, oh, OK, I I appreciate why this is so important. Then you start listening to it and you go, wow, all that stuff I couldn't hear when I was younger because I didn't want to hear it. Yeah. And so for that, on a personal level, the sort of re-education uh, element of meeting these guys is, is, is brilliant. Yeah, totally. So it's... Uh... You guys are incredibly gracious with your time. And this has been, like I said, this is, you would expect somebody like myself to be into this for like 10 years and finally get Mick and Dan on. But, uh, oh, come on, come on. <laughs> we've seen the list of people. Seriously, that's, uh, we've seen the list of people you've had on, John. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's like, I think we, even those folks would agree, we're all fans of what you guys do. And I do, I, I honestly, it's not hyperbole. I do feel like there's, you guys represent, some sort of goodwill ambassadors because it's like everybody loves you guys you oh know? that's very kind and i would that's say that, you know, i would also say the same about and maybe to a lesser degree because i don't know if people follow um um lee and pete yeah. on Amazon, yeah. but they they too have that same very approachable wonderful loving they've got a chemistry between themselves but they just yeah. really awesome guys we 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 owe a lot to Lee. Uh, 
and Pete, but we knew Lee before Pete came along. There's the whole other story there. Pete and I were <laughs> were friends before all of that. Um, but what Pete did with Rob Chapman back in the day, uh, what Lee did with Rob Chapman back in the day, sort of set the blueprint actually, because regardless of the content, what we what we we realized without realizing it was that it was the interaction of the two of them that made it fun to watch. Mm. And it was a, it was a sea change away from this very kind of highbrow journalism yeah. that I'd been involved in previously. It was like, Oh, wow, you can have a personality, you can have a laugh and you can say what you think. And without really thinking about it, that's, that's what we did. Yeah. And we've got to say a big thanks to Lee because not only did he, was it inspiring, but Lee was massively supportive of us right from the get go. In fact, a lot of people thought we were part of Anderson's, um, which we weren't, but um, he was incredibly supportive and remains a, a really close buddy all these years later. So, yeah, I was uh, down big, with them, massive thanks to those guys. I was down with them today, um, filming uh, Anderson's uh, gig rig dealer, and they so they want, they, we filmed some uh, G3S videos with them. And what well, as a story I, I've told uh, before, but Lee is a massive champion of, of British manufacturing and, and design in the music industry. And he's incredibly uh, generous with his time and, and he's always on the end of the phone. Um, he's been so helpful. And when we started going, he, you know, like in the really early days, he calls and says, guys, I really think what you're doing is great. And we said, oh, Lee, come down on the show. And he's like, jumped in his car. Drove to Swindon just to come on the, on the show, you know, when we had, you know, 15,000 subscribers or whatever it was. And it was, he was just, just yeah. He, when he's, he recognizes things. Yeah, yeah. So I, 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 clearly, that, you know, there, there was a commercial benefit to uh, being mentioned on that pedal show. I'm get, I guess he saw a little bit of that, but it, that was by no means his motivation primary it, motivation. No. He used yeah. to lend us stuff out the shop, you know. And anything we wanted to buy, that he let us buy it, whatever he paid for it, which is like I've never met another retailer like that. <laughs> so yeah. he was, yeah, well, we, good egg, yeah, good egg, good egg. My wife and I were married in May, and we took a two-week honeymoon. We were in Scotland for a week, and we we're in England for a week. And uh, we were, she was like, "Where do where do you want to go?" And it was like, "Well, I'd love to go to Guildford to go to Anderton." <laughs> I, and I think that the guys in the, that pedal show are in Swindon, I think. And at, at the very least, we could stop by and see Andy Partridge. She's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> of all the bands that I love, and there's many, many, the one, the, the one that I have carried a, a torch for the longest would be XTC. I, I, I really, truly think that they're up there with the Beatles, maybe a little bit. I know I'm, just, I'm the same. I think Andy Partridge will go down as one of the greatest songwriters, um, you know, certainly of the 20th century. Before we get any further, congratulations to you guys, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> we, we met later in life. She grew up in L.A. I grew up in Cincinnati. So we're we were uh, and we just happened to meet. We live here in Raleigh, North Carolina, but we met through uh, just me moving down here and all that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, I, I do really think that Andy stands alone. Uh, yeah. As, at he's a genius is that absolute musical genius yeah and and then uh another bucket list moment was talking to dave dave gregory he was so kind but i had always wanted to ask him about his solo on the song that wave from the none such album <laughs> that's that song if you just soloed that track and listened to the and i told him i i, I feel like if you just listen to the solo by itself you would get everything that you need to know about that song. It's the most emotive huh. and uh, transplendent, if that's a word, solos. It's amazing. And he yeah, was he he's a, was a master of that, of just giving the song exactly what it needed. You know, so I, I like you. I'm a massive XTC fan. I met my wife, who's from Swindon, uh, playing. Uh, XTC songs in a in a club in Sydney at in Manly Beach and she was there and she used to be in a band with Barry Andrews. Oh wow. And so uh she she said hi and like that that was that was it. <laughs> and then ended up in Swindon and then ended up 
meeting Dave Gregory and then ended up being in a band with him for 10 years. <laughs> um, it was pretty crazy. Um, you know, did two albums uh, with Tin Spirits and yeah. just being in the room with Dave doing his thing, man, it's just extraordinary. He'd get a whiff of an idea and then it'd just be off. And what I think what's really interesting about Dave as well, I think a lot of people miss this, is he did a lot of BVs uh, on, you know, on some uh, spirits tracks. And as soon as you hear his voice, he's got this really airy, he'd always say, nothing but air, Dan, it's nothing but air. <laughs> and you'd hear this voice and you hear this and it's like, oh, wow. Well. You can hear the sound in these and the XTC tracks of his BV. Um, but his arranging and stuff. And like for me, the acid test was, you know, I, I love Andy uh, and, and all the stuff. My favorite XTC tracks are there are when Dave was in the band. Yes. Because he bring he bought something that the synergy of a band, you know, was just, yeah, magic. But, uh, you know, it was a real, it was one of the great honors of my professional and personal life being in a band with that guy and just making music was truly wonderful. Yeah. So again, we could, we could talk for hours, but man, I, I can't tell you what this means to me. It's the, the high watermark thus far of, no, <laughs> yeah. and also to give a shout out to my good friend, Tom Gray, who makes uh Oh yeah. 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 I noticed I, the logo. I, I was thinking, what I was, is that Minerick? Is it, but it's gray. Yeah, of course it is. Yes, this is my, uh, it's, uh -huh. he, he designed this kind of with uh, Gilmore's, um, the the white strat. The, oh, yeah. cool. But it's also got a bit of uh, Nile Rogers thing with the pick guard. Yeah, 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 yeah. This thing, nice. amazing guitar. I became friends with he and his wife, Phoebe, and, um, and also with uh, Tim Rennick. And when it, uh, we got to see those guys uh, on my, on our honeymoon, we had dinner with them in uh, uh, oh, wicked. Thoreau. Yeah. Cornwall. So that was super fun. Lovely. Nice, man. Yeah, so it's cool. Well, thank you so much, John. We have, uh, we have our live Q&A um, right. to get ready for. Great to meet so, you. Uh, yeah. yeah, you Great too, to meet mate. You. Thanks Cheers, so buddy. much. Thank you for tuning in to the Guitar Hang podcast. Interviews with noteworthy guitar players from around the world. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button and ring the bell for notifications to stay updated on our latest episodes.